In August 2000, Russia's Northern Fleet organized Summer X, a three-day training exercise in the Barents Sea. It was organized on a scale not seen since the fall of the Soviet Union ten years earlier. Because of the economic depression that followed the reforms of President Boris Yeltsin, the budgets for the Navy had been slashed, causing the Northern Fleet to collapse. Maintenance was not carried out regularly and non-essential services such as a search and rescue fleet were mostly cut, all to keep up appearances. But Russia had a new president now, Vladimir Vladimirovich Putin, and the Northern Fleet wanted to honor his 100th day in office with a grand display of their military might. They hoped it would convince the president to send more money their way. On August 12, 2000, at about 11.30 in the morning, in the middle of the Summer War Games, two consecutive explosions rocked the Barren Sea. One of the unusual blasts registered 3.5 on the Richter scale. The radio crew on Western submarines who were spying in the area heard the explosions and reported to their superiors that it sounded like a Russian nuclear submarine had gone down. Though some Russian ships had heard the underwater blasts, no one thought anything of it. They were in the middle of a war exercise, there'd been explosions all over the place. However, once the drills were over, the Northern Fleet was unable to contact their best submarine in the fleet, the Kursk, which had also failed to launch any practice torpedoes. The strict protocols in place for such an event were not followed. The admirals were reluctant to tell their superiors that they'd lost a billion-dollar nuclear-powered cruise missile submarine. They might lose their jobs. When the K-141 failed to answer any calls and did not make her final scheduled contact, the fleet commanders knew that they could no longer hide the fact that the Kursk and her crew were in trouble. Twelve hours after the explosions, the fleet finally sounded the alarm and launched a massive search and rescue operation. In the strict hierarchical world of the Kremlin, only two men were allowed to call the Russian president to discuss military affairs, the defense minister Marshal Igor Shujaev and the head of the general staff, General Anatoly Kvashnin. At 15 minutes after midnight on Sunday, the 13th of August, half an hour after receiving the phone call from Northern Fleet Commander-in-Chief Admiral Vyacheslav Papov, the Navy Commander-in-Chief Admiral Vladimir Kuryedov contacted Surjaev. He told him that their billion-dollar nuclear-powered cruise missile submarine, the Kursk, was missing. Surjaev decided to wait for more information and not wake President Putin, who had just started his vacation in Sochi. Very discreetly, key officials all over the Kola Peninsula received the Northern Fleet's alarm. The message also reached officers in the Kursk crew hometown, Vijayeva, but the crew's family members were told nothing. Senior officers from the Kursk sister sub, Varons, were ordered to prepare their vessel for a search effort. They were not told which boat was missing. The Varons wasn't exactly seaworthy. She was supposed to take part in the Summer X exercise, but the sub had had too many technical issues. The Kursk went in her stead, but had raided Varons for spare parts. If the sub was limping before, she was crippled now. 12.30 a.m., the rescue vessel Mikhail Radnetsky finally left the dock in Zveromorsk. Captain Yuri Koistin and his crew didn't know who they were supposed to rescue, but there were secret agents aboard the ship, monitoring their every transmission. That could only mean that whatever had happened was big. The Radnetsky carried two deep submergence rescue vehicles, DSRVs, they were the AS-32 and the AS-34, the Pries. But the ship had no stabilizers to keep the vessel in position during stormy weather, and with two cranes instead of an A-frame, she could only lower the submersibles in calm seas. The barren sea was rarely calm. 
The submersible AS-32 could use her manipulator arms to connect hoses to special valves and feed oxygen and heat into a stricken submarine. But she could not evacuate sailors from a downed sub, and attaching hoses to the Kursk specifically could only be done by divers. The deep-sea divers needed for this operation were not on standby, because the fleet didn't have any diving support vessels with decompression chambers. Well, they did. Two Leenok or India-class submarines, each carrying a pair of Poseidon-class DSRVs, had the decompression chambers. But due to a lack of funds, the vessels had spent the last six years in a St. Petersburg shipyard for repairs. Radnetsky's other submersible, the Priest, could latch on to the submarine's escape hatches and bring up 18 people at a time in something called the dry method. But the Priest was flawed. Among other things, her batteries were weak, limiting the amount of time the mini-sub could be underwater. And her experienced pilots had recently rotated out, and new specialists were waiting to be trained. The Northern Fleet had another rescue sub, the AS-36, the Beaster. She was slightly larger and heavier than the Priest, but her mothership had been decommissioned in the mid-1990s and the rescue vehicle sat in a warehouse. If she was to be deployed, the Beaster would have to be brought to the scene independently. With a maximum speed of 60 knots, it would take the Ratnetsky 11 hours to arrive at the search area. One thirty a.m. The fleet's only operational nuclear battle cruiser, the Peter the Great, had not found the Kursk yet. She was designed to be hard to find, and her impressive stealth capabilities frustrated the search efforts. The cruiser's navigator chief did pick up faint pulses on the sonar, a series of about seven knocks that seemed to respond to the Peter the Great sonar pings. They were closing in, because the signal was getting stronger. The sonar guys believed they were listening to an automated SOS generated by the stricken sub. An hour later, they picked up another noise. Grinding metal. 3.15 a.m. Daylight came and the Russian destroyers, the Admiral Chubanenka and the Admiral Kharlamov, joined the search. Everyone kept their eyes peeled for any sign of the K-141 or a foreign submarine. If the Kursk was down, she must have collided with one of NATO's spy vessels. The Kursk was unsinkable. There was no other explanation. The tapping continued in three clusters of eight to nine taps, all seemingly responding to the Peter the Great signals. The cruiser headed straight for the signal's location. A little later, the Peter the Great's crew spotted a large blue and green object. This buoy couldn't have been from the Kursk, because they hadn't arrived at the signal's location yet. Perhaps it belonged to the foreign submarine. They launched the small boat to bring it on board for examination. By the time the sailors had reached the spot, the object had vanished. 40 minutes later, at 4.38 a.m., the Peter the Great's echo sounder picked up an anomaly on the sea floor. An object. 50 feet tall. All sonars of the fleet were now trained on the object. 15 radio men on various ships agreed that the knocking sounded like an SOS signal. But whether it was human, they couldn't tell. Vice Admiral Alec Birtsev didn't believe it was an SOS. They were hearing the creaking and clanging of a dying submarine. Two hours later, Lookout spotted an oil slick. Each of Russia's four fleets, the Northern, the Pacific, the Baltic Sea and the Black Sea, had its own search and rescue unit. Rear Admiral Gennady Virich was the Navy's rescue chief, in charge of all four services. He got the job the year the Soviet Union collapsed and had to make do with ever-shrinking budgets. The Northern Fleet needed one million dollars last year for maintenance. They received 14,000. At 5 o'clock Sunday morning, Virich got a call from the Navy Command Center in Moscow. The Northern Fleet's war games had hit a snag. The commanders had mysteriously lost contact with the Kursk. Virich asked to be kept updated, but stayed at home. 
folks were probably just confused about the Kursk's report time, or the boat's communication mast was busted. He'd go to the office in a few hours and plan a response in case the Kursk was really down. At 7.15 a.m., with General Kvashnin on vacation, it fell to Marshal Surjaev to interrupt the president's holiday in Sochi. When he told Putin that the Northern Fleet had lost the country's newest nuclear submarine, the president wanted to know about the nuclear reactors and what was being done to save the people on board. Putin offered to fly to the Northern Fleet headquarters, but Surjaev told him that rescue officials had everything they needed. Everything was under control. If the president came over, the press would know something was up. The situation was still unclear and the Navy wasn't ready to make any press announcements yet. Stay put, they got this. That morning, sailors who had been searching for the sub returned to Vijayeva. One of them stood in a breadline and complained that he was exhausted. He'd been up all night looking for the Kursk. One of the women in the line fainted. Soon, the rumors raged through the small base like a wildfire in the jungle. The wives and family members exchanged news, but no two pieces of information were the same. Because of the constant personnel changes, few knew for sure their loved ones were even on board the Kursk. The crew usually consisted of about a little over a hundred people. But it was anyone's guess who had and hadn't been assigned to the submarine for the games. But the Kursk was unsinkable and not many people on the base believed the rumors. She probably just had some communication issues. Still, some family members tracked down the deputy base commander. He checked and told them that the few officers at headquarters that Sunday morning were just chilling. There was no emergency. Out on the Barents Sea, the Radnetsky headed toward the Altay salvage tug. She got the coordinates wrong and missed the rendezvous point losing another 90 minutes. The Peter the Great had found an acoustic anomaly, but they didn't know if it was the Kursk. For all they knew, it was some old shipwreck. If this was the Kursk, then she suffered no mere mechanical failure. All the submarine's emergency systems had failed. There was no sign of an emergency buoy, and no signal nor verified SOS had been heard, and no one had used the escape pod. At 8 a.m. it was time for a shift change aboard the Peter the Great. The new sonar men detected a new series of tapping sounds. Three successive knocks, a pause, three successive knocks. It was an SOS. If the Kursk crew was alive, trapped in the submarine, they had a few options of getting out. There was an escape pod that could be entered from the second compartment. It had room for a hundred people, basically the entire crew. Once released, it would go straight to the surface and start broadcasting a signal. All the team had to do was wait to get picked up. If the sub was in relatively shallow waters, another way to leave the submarine was to crawl through the torpedo launch tubes and swim to the surface. There was also an escape hatch in the ninth compartment aft of the submarine. On Russian subs, the hatch was there for a rescue submersible to dock. Once connected, the submariners could simply climb through the hatches into the mini-sub and get taken to the surface. But, in case of an emergency, and if the submarine wasn't submerged more than 328 feet, individual sailors wearing special escape suits could get into the escape trunk, close the lower hatch, flood the trunk to equalize the pressure so they could open the upper hatch, and then shoot to the surface. Rinse and repeat over a hundred times. But once at the surface, the sailor wasn't in the clear yet. Cold water entered his suit, and if there were no rescue ships nearby to pick him up, he'd freeze to death within hours. Because of all the dangers of using the escape hatch, the Russian crew might be better off to stay put and wait for rescue. After all, the buoy had deployed, they had sank in the middle of the fleet and close to the shore. But staying put wasn't without risks either. Any survivors on the Kursk faced four immediate problems. Starvation wasn't one of them, neither was dehydration. They had canned meats, peanut butter, bottled water, powdered milk and chocolate bars. The four problems were caused by one thing, 
In case of an emergency, the nuclear reactor shut down. The submarine had no more power. No submarine is watertight, and without the bilge pumps, cold water would seep into the compartment and could drown the sailors. The water entering a sealed compartment pushed the air inside into a smaller and smaller space, increasing the pressure on the sailors' bodies. The human body gradually adjusts to the rising pressure, but the compressed air contains nitrogen that enters the bloodstream. The sailors would soon reach a point where they would be trapped, because on the surface, where the pressure was normal, the nitrogen in their blood becomes gas and gives them decompression sickness, the bends, fatal. But then it was getting cold inside, although the residual heat from the reactors would linger for a while, Without power, the temperature inside the sub would soon drop, and they would have to put on the thermal emergency clothing stored in each compartment. But once the cold water flooding the sub reached the sailors' feet, they wouldn't last much longer, and if they stamped their feet or moved around to keep warm, they'd use up too much oxygen. This was a problem because when someone breathes, they inhale oxygen and exhale carbon dioxide. Without power, the air system was turned off, and in a sealed compartment, with no air circulation, the oxygen level gradually goes down and the carbon dioxide level goes up. Too little oxygen kills a person. Too much carbon dioxide kills a person sooner. Every submarine had an emergency air purifying system. They were brick-sized oxygen regeneration plates. When the survivors ripped the package open and exposed the plates to the air, they'd have more oxygen and less carbon dioxide. However, the chemicals used in these plates were superoxides, read super volatile. If a plate came in contact with oil, for instance, it would ignite. And in severely compressed air, this flame would be huge, and that flame would use up all the remaining oxygen in seconds. If they could keep the water out, the packs would provide air for up to a day. If they panicked or moved around a lot, like knocking out an SOS or trying to get out of the escape trunk, they would use a lot of oxygen. If they wanted to last longer, they had to remain calm in a dark, freezing and flooding compartment. 21 hours after the explosions, the rescue ship the Ratnitsky entered the southwest corner of the military exercise area. ETA to the suspected wreck site was noon, another three hours or so. At 9.30 a.m., Northern Fleet crewmen sighted another submerged buoy, a greenish obelisk a few feet below the surface. But the object sank before anyone could hook it. Of course, a buoy did one thing and one thing only – float. It would never sink. Admiral Einar Skorgen, in charge of Defense Command Northern Norway, was stationed at the military headquarters in Bude. The base was a bunch of Cold War bunkers cut into a mountain designed back in the day to withstand a Soviet nuclear attack. DEFCOM NON kept watch over the Barren Sea, using radar stations, signals tracking units and P-3 Orion submarine tracker aircraft, among other things. Commander North Norway had a phone in his office with a direct line to the Northern Fleet Chief Admiral Pakov. They had told everyone that the phone was used in case Norway and Russia needed to coordinate searches for lost fishermen. Yeah, no. The link was strictly military. Skorgin was aware of the Russian naval exercise, but Summer X was held deep within home waters and all maneuvers involving the firing of live munitions had been announced. The training was a threat to no one. That Sunday afternoon, Skorgin received a visit from two intelligence officers at his home. It was probably nothing. But Norwegian surveillance assets had noticed that Russian ships were forming protective rings around a stretch of water to the northeast of Severomorsk. It looked like a search and rescue pattern. They thought he should know. The Admiral assumed that the Russians were simply doing a search and rescue drill and thought little more of it. Skorgin and Admiral Papov were friendly and the commander figured that if there was a real problem, he would get a call from him.
On the American East Coast, just after sunrise, Supreme Allied Commander Atlantic, Commander-in-Chief United States Joint Forces Command Rear Admiral Harold Gaiman, and Commander of the U.S. Navy's Atlantic Submarine Division Vice Admiral John Grossenbecker met on the sidewalk outside their homes, the only place they could talk without being overheard. Grossenbacher told Gaiman that Captain Breer of the USS Memphis had transmitted a text report from the Barents Sea. The captain believed they'd witnessed an Oscar II-class Russian nuclear submarine exploding and going down. There was data to back up his claim. Captain Breer swore that the Memphis was not involved, but Gaiman knew that the Russians would blame the Americans anyway and experience had taught him not to trust the submarine captain's first report regarding an underwater incident. He needed to verify the U.S. submarine's position relative to the Russian sub and get in touch with the USS Toledo as well. Gaiman called the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff to make sure that no one made any hasty statements denying U.S. involvement until he had personally verified the U.S. submarines were not involved. At noon, the Radnetsky went for anchor close to the unidentified object and prepared to launch one of her submersibles. Two hours later, Admiral Popov arrived on the Peter the Great and quickly assumed command over the rescue operations. He was quickly briefed. They believed an unknown number of trapped submariners were sending out signals to indicate their position. It sounded like they were signaling a rising water level within the Kursk. At 4 p.m., the Admiral Khalamov reported a steady tapping of 20 successive rhythmic beats on a bearing of 129 degrees. An SOS! No, it was the anchor chain of the Radnetsky striking the anchor hole. The rescue crew aboard the Radnetsky had trouble getting the AS-34 submersible in the water because of the wind. It ended up taking five hours to launch the priest. A 20-year-old submersible with such low-performance batteries that every dive could end in disaster. Aboard were three men. The pilots Alexander Misuk and Sergei Pirtsev, and the submarine engineer and specialist in the design of the Oscar II-class submarines, Sergei Batskik. Batskik would help bring Kursk sailors into the mini-sub, and if any men were unable to climb aboard because they were unconscious or badly injured, Batskik would climb down into the wreck and triage. This required nerves of steel. Misuk lowered the priest to 200 feet and then lay perfectly still. His sonar screen only picked up schools of fish, but no sub. The Radnetsky sent out a sonic probe or ping and a radio signal. If this was the Kursk and the ping came in at the right angle, it should trigger the automatic acoustic station on board the submarine to send a response. The priest crew could then home in on that signal and find the Kursk. Six minutes later, they heard a signaling response from the anomaly. Misuk and Pirtsev followed the generated signals. It was slow going because they had to preserve power. Half an hour later, the priest had a tight enough lock to close in on the unknown object. Ten minutes after that, at 6 p.m., the sonar showed something dead ahead. At first, Misa couldn't see anything. Whatever it was had a hull that absorbed sonar signals. But then the priest's light reflected off of the only part of the submarine not covered in rubber. Two bronze propellers of an Oscar II-class submarine. Nearly 31 hours after the explosions, the Northern Fleet had officially found its billion-dollar nuclear submarine, the Kursk. The Priest mini-submarine detected no internal activity inside the Kursk. And with limited battery power and no stabilizers, the current made it hard to maneuver over the hatch. The crew was unfamiliar with the shape of the Kursk. They had to be careful not to hit the sub's large tail, the propellers or the rear stabilizers. The pilots had never practiced on a nuclear submarine before either, because the subs were never allowed to just lie on the seafloor for that. 
Misuk figured he'd start at compartment 5 and use the current to slowly push them back to the 9th. It took them directly over the emergency buoy that had failed to deploy, and hopefully wouldn't suddenly do so now. Using their thrusters to counteract the drift of the current, they tried to hold their position near the hatch. Then, a sudden rush of the current sent the priest crashing into the Kursk's upper rudder. The crew detected no leaks, but they had to go up to assess the damage. After a dive of only one hour and ten minutes, they had risked everything and achieved nothing, except damaging the propulsion system. The priest had to be repaired. Captain Alexander Tieslienka didn't want to waste a minute and ordered the launch of the AS-32 to make a survey of the Kursk's entire hull to assess the full extent of the damage. The reconnaissance mission was a fiasco. The AS-32 couldn't find the Kursk. The search managers had set the diving depth incorrectly and her poor sonar left her half-blind and circling near the sea floor. By the time Captain Pavel Karaputa managed to locate the sub, the AS-32 had run out of power. The pilot could only make a limited observation pass, but was then forced to return to the surface. Another sort of SOS signal was picked up by the Ratnitsky, but a closer analysis revealed it was biological in nature. More bad news. The weather forecast predicted a storm would sweep across the Barents Sea within the next 24 hours. It would make diving to the Kursk impossible. In the US, National Security Council Secretary Mark Medish had a strategy meeting with top officials of the Clinton administration. Should the US race to the rescue or wait for the Russians to ask for help? The Clinton administration wanted to help, but Russia had never been friendly to the US and the Kursk had been designed to blow American Navy men to kingdom come. Besides, if the US offered help, the Russians would think they only offered it so they could gather military secrets in the process. And the sub had been down for nearly 32 hours. The Russian officials had told the public nothing. And had the admirals even told President Putin everything? Anything? The group decided not to make a move. Russia had to flinch first. And they wouldn't announce anything to the public either. Not until Russia did. In Russia, Sunday evening, a state-owned television network broadcasted the pre-recorded footage of Admiral Popov announcing the success of the Barren Sea exercise. Everyone in Vajayeva was like, say what? Did Popov say everything was alright now? Had the Admiral simply forgotten about the broadcast? Or had he allowed it to air accidentally on purpose to keep everyone in the dark a little longer? At 4.30 a.m. Monday morning, the priests returned to the water and submerged 40 minutes later. At 7 a.m., the submersible reached the Kursk and tried twice to land on the rescue hatch of the 9th compartment. They had to line up the priest precisely over the hatch, keep her steady, lower the sub, grab a little rod sticking out of the center of the hatch to secure her in place, open a valve to create a vacuum between the mini-sub and the Kursk, pump the water out, open all the hatches and bring the sailors on board. Again and again they tried to make the seal, but they could never hold on to the rod that would secure their exact position. After one hour, the power ran low and they had to return to the surface to get new batteries. But there were no spare batteries and the crew had to wait for them to be recharged. They could do a quick recharge and get it back in the water within an hour, but that would reduce the battery life and the things were too expensive to replace. When the Soviet Union broke up, Balt Electric, the small company that produced the expert batteries for submersibles, was free to pick its own line of products. The highly specialized batteries weren't cost-effective. They now charged the Navy the outrageous amount of one million dollars for one battery. Not that the Navy had money for them at any price. At the time, no one in the government cared enough to deal with it. They had had other things to worry about. 
On Monday morning, NATO's naval analysts checking their satellite feeds realized that none of the Russian warships had returned to port at the end of the summer war games. Instead, vessels were rushing to leave northern fleet ports. Commander North Norway Admiral Skorgen sent a P-3 Orion reconnaissance plane to scan the area to find out what was going on out there. The aircraft had powerful cameras and a sideways-looking radar, transmitting real-time photographic and sonar images back to Baudet. The Russians were either in the middle of an exceptionally realistic search-and-rescue drill, or there was an actual emergency. Meanwhile, in the United Kingdom, British Navy Commodore David Russell arrived at the offices of the Northwood Royal Navy headquarters in London. His boss was on vacation, so Russell was the acting flag officer's submarines, the man in charge of Britain's attack subs and Trident nuclear deterrents. He got a call that there was unusual naval activity in the Barents Sea. It might be part of the Russian exercise, but something was off. The Russians were using communication circuits rarely used by the Northern Fleet. Probably nothing, but he should know. Like Admiral Skorgen, Commodore Russell figured that the activity was just another part of the exercise, a search and rescue drill. Meanwhile, the Norwegian Radiation Protection Authority picked up a rumor that a Russian nuclear submarine had had an accident. They should check radiation levels in the area pronto. Finally, on Monday morning, the 14th of August at 10.30 a.m., Russian Navy spokesman Captain Igor Digala informed his countrymen on state-controlled radio that on Sunday, the nuclear-powered submarine the Kursk had suffered minor technical difficulties while participating in the Barents Sea exercises. Her captain had descended to the ocean floor to assess the situation. They had established contact with the crew and were pumping air and power to the boat, and they communicated with them by tapping signals. Everyone on board is alive, and no casualties had been reported. Within hours, the story spread around the globe. The potential human tragedy of the trapped crew generated sympathy, and the potential environmental catastrophe of the sub's nuclear reactors generated concern. The families in Vijayeva were getting worried. Even kids knew that a nuclear sub didn't just lie on the seafloor because of minor technical issues. Everything de Gala had said was a lie. And when the Russian Navy beamed a positive message out into the world, they hadn't counted on Frude Ringdal, the scientific director of Norsar, the Norwegian seismic array. In Norway, Ringdal had spent all Monday morning trying to figure out the abnormal readings that had been recorded by his array over the weekend. It was not a nuclear test, and the barren sea was too stable for an earthquake. Having spent a lifetime studying seismology, Ringdal knew he was looking at the clear pattern of two artificially generated explosions. The seismic array could accurately pinpoint the event's location. When Ringdal heard the reports about a missing submarine in that very area, he knew the Russians were lying. The submarine accident had not happened on Sunday, and it had definitely not been a simple mechanical problem. The director warned officials at the Norwegian Defense Ministry. They, in turn, urged Admiral Skorgen to use his hotline to pop off and asked the Admiral point-blank what had happened in the Barents Sea. Skorgen was like, I'ma need a better reason than that for calling him. Fine, offer them our assistance. Skorgen called and requested to be connected to Popov. Well, uh, the Admiral couldn't talk to him because he was aboard his flagship conducting military exercises. Yeah, about that. Skorgen asked about the situation in the Barents Sea and said that he was authorized by his government to offer assistance if they needed it. Please hold. A minute later, Skorgen was told that Admiral Popov sent his kind regards. This situation was under control. They had no need for any assistance.
Five minutes after the Navy's radio message, CNN reported about the Kursk accident to the rest of the world. Submarine rescue professionals everywhere set up when they heard the news. They were relieved to hear that the Kursk was lying at a relatively shallow depth. The submarine's crew could use their survival bodysuits and get to the surface through an emergency escape hatch. Everyone working in the offshore industry also took notice. On the diving support vessel, the Seaway Eagle, Stolt offshore manager Graham Mann heard about the Kursk on the satellite television in his cabin. He quickly realized that the Seaway Eagle was the closest diving support vessel to the disaster site. He'd better start coming up with a deployment plan, in case anyone called. At 11 a.m., Russia's main television network, RTR, interrupted its regular scheduled programming with a separate announcement. The nuclear-powered submarine the Kursk is lying on the floor of the Barents Sea. There are no nuclear weapons on board the submarine. Unofficial queries from the Norwegian side are being made about the radiation levels and about the possibility of offering assistance. But, according to US-funded Radio Liberty, the Kursk was nosed down at the bottom, filling with water. And soon after, the international media found out about the Norwegian seismic array registering two explosions on Saturday. Everyone was confused. The Russians stuck to their story. The accident had happened on Sunday. Silly Norwegians. Huh. Moscow was doing the old-school Soviet thing, using lies and deception to cover up their military boo-boos. With the Russians more or less coming clean, American officials now had to consider their next move. From the scale of the detonations recorded by Norsar, and judging by the reports of the USS Memphis, they figured that the submarine was gone and that everyone was dead. Offering assistance was now a political game of chess. In their opening move, the US made a token offer for help. They knew it would be rejected. A Norwegian and British rescue effort would be a better fit anyway. Norway had the diving platforms they needed. The Royal Navy's deep submergence rescue vehicle used for these kinds of operations was on the right side of the Atlantic, only a few hours flying time from Murmansk. That was precisely what Commodore Russell thought when he heard the news of the downed submarine. Western analysts knew very little about the Northern Fleet's rescue submersibles, but Commander Russell suspected the Russians would need every bit of help they could get. Britain had one of the best submarine rescue systems in the world, the LR-5 submersible, which was often described as an underwater helicopter because of its maneuverability and versatility. Her transfer skirt fit on any submarine's escape tower or hatch, and could bring 13 trapped sailors to the surface at a time. Russell had no ministerial clearance from London, nor a request from help from the Russians, but he went ahead anyway. He said, All navies, unless at war, have a duty to help one another. This is an unshakable value for those who go to sea, even more so for submariners. It was a little ironic, because Russell had a secret past. He was a veteran submariner. He had covertly patrolled the Barents Sea and surveyed the Kola Peninsula many times through a periscope. The UK Submarine Rescue Service was on its way to a training exercise near Turkey, and equipment was all over the place. Judging from his log, Russell moved fast. Within minutes, he mobilized Commander Hoskins and the UK SRS, sent everything and everyone back to the service's base in Scotland, ordered the release of an Antonov cargo plane from Canada to fly the LR-5 to the closest available port, and arranged for the offshore support vessel Norman Pioneer to serve as the mothership. Russell didn't check whether he had the authority to do this. Ain't nobody got time for that, he said. There is a tradition in the Royal Navy of doing what you think is right, taking the initiative and being prepared to justify it later, rather than doing nothing and being unable to justify your inaction. This was an example of what Royal Navy senior officers were expected to do, the right thing. Within two hours, Russell was able to tell the Royal Navy's Commander-in-Chief, Admiral Sir Nigel Essenai, that they were ready to offer the Russians their services. 
All the while, British officials had argued about whether the United Kingdom should respond at all. On the one hand, this was one of Russia's most secretive classes of submarines that was built to destroy them. On the other hand, it would be good PR if the British managed to save the Russian submariners from an icy death. Either way, the Russians had gone public with the news. They should at least offer their assistance. John Spaller of the UK Ministry of Defence faxed a formal rescue offer to the Russian Defence Minister Sergei. I was very concerned to hear about one of your submarines currently experiencing difficulty in the Barents Sea. I am sure that your own navy is extremely capable of resolving the incident and rescuing all those involved. I would, however, like to offer assistance in the form of the use of our rescue vehicle LR5 and the ROV Scorpio and advice and assistance on the handling of casualties. The UK submarine rescue system is about to be transported to an exercise in the eastern Mediterranean. It would be no trouble at all to divert the equipment to assist your submarine in the Barents Sea and we would be happy to do this, should you so wish. If we can be of any assistance, my defense attaché in Moscow stands ready to relay any messages back to London. Crickets. At the same time Britain offered help, NATO offered help as a bloc. Again, crickets. U.S. National Security Advisor Sandy Berger finally got a hold of Russian Security Council Chief Sergei Ivanov in Sochi. A U.S. rescue operation could be underway within 24 to 48 hours. Just say the word. Thanks. Our military men say they can handle it on their own. Everyone knew that Russia didn't like dealing with NATO as a bloc, so individual NATO countries now each offer their assistance. France, Germany, the Netherlands, Italy and Canada, but also Sweden and Japan wanted to help. Everyone was told to chill. The Russians got this. The Norwegian Crisis Committee for Nuclear Accidents asked a Norwegian defense research vessel to collect seawater samples as close to the accident site as possible. The three experts sent to the site detected no contamination. It appeared that the submarine's nuclear reactors had shut down during the emergency, as they were supposed to. At 2 p.m., the independent Russian TV channel NTV broke into its regular scheduled programming with a special bulletin. The Kursk was down, the submarine's bow was damaged and flooded, all power on board had been cut. Two hours later, the Navy denied the flooding and once more claimed that the incident had happened on Sunday. Everyone and their mother knew by now that the Kursk had gone down on Saturday. Two hours after that, at 6 p.m. Monday evening, the commander-in-chief of the Russian Navy made his first public comments on the Kursk accident. Admiral Kuryedov was not optimistic at all. The Kursk was severely damaged, the situation was complicated and not everything would turn out well. The sub was buried deep in silt and listing heavily to port by as much as 30 degrees. Oh, and another thing, there are reasons to believe there had been a big and serious collision. But let's hear it for the many sailors risking their lives to save the lives of the Kurs crew, huh? Their incredible bravery and devotion to duty were inspirational. For the first time, a senior official had used the word Stolnavini, collision. Kurieto felt sure he could make the charges stick. Admiral Popov had used the Summer X as a cover for a secret deployment of an SSBN. If an American spy submarine had figured out that the exercise was a decoy and raced to track the disappearing boomer, it could very well have collided with the Kursk. Russian defense officials claimed that an unidentified foreign vessel had communicated an SOS from the area, and wreckage with western markings had been seen on the ocean's surface. If it were true, though, there had to be two submarines lying crippled on the bottom of the Barents Sea. 
The chances of a Western sub remaining afloat after striking the giant Oscar II were about the same as a Humvee ramming a tank, wrecking the tank, but itself still able to drive away. Russian officials believed that the West, meaning the US, would soon be forced to acknowledge a submarine disaster of its own. And if it hadn't been an American sub, perhaps the Royal Navy's HMS Splendid was involved, a particularly disruptive and aggressively commanded submarine. According to London, the HMS Splendid was thousands of miles away. It wasn't. The Americans could barely contain their fury at Corriedo's obvious stab at US involvement in the accident, but they refused to take the bait. The Pentagon simply stated that there was no information to suggest that a US submarine or surface vessel had been involved in a collision with the Russian sub. But they had offered to help, and the Russians hadn't accepted it. Yet, rattled by the accusations and not wholly trusting US submarine captains, Berger wanted to get the story from the American subs in the Barrens himself. Everyone told him not to ask the Memphis or the Toledo to call in until they had sufficiently cleared the area. But Berger declared this an exceptional circumstance and went over their heads. He ordered the submarine captains to transmit a radio report on their status ASAP. One Pentagon official called it the Berger panic attack. They seemed unaware that Gaiman had already demanded the exact same information from both submarines. Why didn't these guys call each other? At four in the afternoon, all Russian rescue operations had to stop. The storm had come in. 8 p.m. Monday evening, Admiral Virich, the Russian Navy search and rescue chief, arrived at the wreck site. But the sea was too rough to allow a transfer to the Ratnitsky. The Admiral was forced to sit out the storm on a nearby warship, communicating with rescuers via regular ship-to-ship -ship VHF radio. Virich was shaken by what he heard. Not only were the rescuers exhausted, they were enraged by the lousy state of their equipment and the flaws of the mothership. But help from the West was politically unacceptable to Moscow. Perhaps Beaster, the most modern of the rescue submersibles, would succeed where the Prees and the AS-32 had failed. The Beaster's mothership had been decommissioned to save money, so the PK-7500 barge, basically a giant floating crane, would have to do. Virich ordered the Beaster to be prepared for launch. The world media had descended on the remote Kola Peninsula, but they got nowhere. Reporters couldn't get onto the base to talk to the families, but the clever ducks interviewed family members arriving from all over Russia at Murmansk train station. Though many of them still weren't sure whether their families were even on the Kursk, the Russian Navy had not released a crew list. They had only said that there were 116 people on board. President Putin summoned Deputy Prime Minister Ilya Klebanov to Sochi and delegated the crisis to him. But the president remained on the Black Sea coast, officially invisible and surreally disconnected. Only Israeli Prime Minister Ehud Barak managed to get in touch with him. He begged him to accept outside help. Israeli's rescue assets were ready to go. Thanks. Putin had been told that the chances of survival of the Kursk crew were minimal. It's already too late. General Kvashnin and General Ivashov scrambled back to Moscow to tackle the issue of accepting Western help. The token gesture from the ultra-spy nation, the United States of America, was a hard no. They denied the collision, but refused to reveal the locations of their subs in the area. Replies to Norway and Britain's offers were put on hold, while Moscow kept bickering. Some officials argued that Russia would look cruel if it rejected foreign expertise. But Russia's defense ministers preferred trapped submariners over vile foreigners who would hurt national pride and spy on them. Those in the north should just keep reporters away from the family members, like they used to, back in Soviet days. Ah, good times. But looming over everyone was the dark shadow of the Defense Ministry's highly secretive organization, the 8th Directorate of the General Staff. 
The 8th Directorate had one job, to protect Russia's military secrets. The Kursk was the most modern submarine they had. Her shipwreck cruise missiles and the encryption equipment in her radio room were among the most sensitive secrets in the Navy. It was absurd to even consider Western specialists coming anywhere near the Kursk. The Northern Fleet was not the Coast Guard and the Kursk was not a fishing boat. If sailors had to die in the defense of Russia's secrets, so be it. In the past, more men had died protecting much less. That the 8th Directorate was actually not the Navy commander's biggest headache. An old Soviet rule dictated that one does not displease the president. They needed to know what Putin wanted, but no one had a clue. On the one hand, he'd been an ultra-secretive KGB colonel. On the other hand, he might want to use the Kursk incident to score brownie points with the West by accepting their help. The Navy commanders and general staff waited for the president to take the lead. The president waited for his Navy commanders and general staff to take the lead. At 1 p.m. Tuesday afternoon, the Navy commanders took the lead and officially turned down all foreign offers for help. Then, just two hours after Russia formally notified NATO it didn't need them, another Russia told NATO it wouldn't hurt to talk. NATO instantly agreed to a meeting. Four hours later, two army colonels from the Russian embassy were in a teleconference call with Commodore Russell at UK's Navy's headquarters. This was a good sign. There was apparently still hope for the crew. Russell patiently explained the capabilities of the Submarine Rescue Service and the LR-5 submersible. He decided not to tell them that everything was already on its way to the Norwegian-Russian border. But the UK could only help if he got technical info, like details on the Oscar II hatches, the sub's angle on the sea floor, the water current, visibility, and what they estimated the pressure inside the Kursk was. But the colonels knew nothing and told him they'd get back to him. They had no authority to grant any permissions. The Commodore continued his unofficial preparations to send over the sub-rescue system. Russell figured he could always fly it all back if the Russians didn't want it. But this way they were at least in the neighborhood, should the request come. The Vijayeva residents had glued to their TV sets, trying to get all the information that no one was telling them. That Tuesday morning, the Russian Navy said that the crew aboard the Kursk was tapping on the hull, using the word Perestukivania. They were talking to each other. But the Navy's liaison for the Kursk crew's families couldn't answer the Kursk crew's wife's questions. Was there really knocking on the hull? How many days could the crew last? There were rumors that Western offers for help were rejected. Why? When the liaison couldn't answer their questions, something snapped in Vijayeva. It was clear. The Russian admirals cared more about the submarine than about their men trapped inside. The wives were young and not used to Soviet-style tactics. Commanders could no longer expect the families of those killed in service to quietly grieve and accept their losses. The women would not be silent, and the whole world would know about their grief. The wives got organized and started a campaign to mobilize public opinion and expose the incompetence of the Russian Navy and its botched rescue mission. They called television stations, demanding them to find out why the Navy hadn't asked for foreign assistance. The Navy moved fast to stop this disturbing movement and sent a proper delegation to give the families an official update. But they couldn't calm everyone down either. They needed some heavy hitters out there, on the double. At 2 p.m. Tuesday, the 15th of August, while the world watched the reports of the Northern Fleet's failing efforts to reach the trapped sailors desperately tapping on the hull, the Russian media found out about the stream of foreign rescue offers that the Navy had rejected. Klebanov, now in charge of the crisis, went on the offensive and boasted about the unparalleled excellence of Russia's own rescue service. Outside help was not needed. The West technology was no better than their homegrown know-how. Meanwhile, 
Putin was caught in a PR nightmare. While everyone in the world watched the mariners' wives, mothers and children wailing for their husbands, sons and fathers fighting for their lives at the bottom of the Barents Sea, President Putin was filmed enjoying his vacation on the Black Sea coast. He was hosting a barbecue and raced across the waters on a jet ski. This display of apparent indifference outraged the families and disgusted the Russians. And the independent press ran with it. But the state-owned media turned on Putin as well. The president was invisible, and no one asked anyone for help. They began to talk about the old Soviet ways, running specials on the historical purges of millions of their fellow citizens. They spoke of lesser-known cases in which Russian citizens were treated as throwaway products, like how army officers had used young conscripts as human mind detectors. How Russian pilgrims still worshipped at Lenin Shrine as though he were a saint, and how older Russians still admired Stalin's brutalities as an occupational hazard to keep a once restless country under control. Moskovsky Komsomolitz newspaper headline screams, Damn you! Do something! But the president did nothing. At 8 p.m. Tuesday evening, the Northern Fleet declared that the Kursk's first three compartments were flooded. The families who knew for sure their men worked in those compartments were shocked. Their loved ones were dead. At the same time, a spokesman from Admiral Popov's deputy Matsak's office insisted the rescuers could still hear tapping. But everyone in the world wondered, how much longer could the men hold out? Out on the Barents Sea, the Radnetsky rescue crew were stunned to hear the news that the Kursk crew was still tapping out SOS messages. They had heard nothing. Were the Northern Fleet officers inventing the reports to put even more pressure on the rescuers? Well, it worked. Bad weather made a rescue effort impossible. But that evening, they tried to get back in the water anyway. The crew had extreme difficulties launching the priests. The twin derricks had been designed for unloading cargo alongside a pier. Even in good weather, operating the derricks out at sea was difficult and with these rough seas, basically impossible. They couldn't get the priest over the side of the Radnetsky. She kept hitting the ship. The priest was a tough cookie, but how many more knocks could she take? Sure enough, the blows eventually busted up the submersible's antennas of the sonar guide station and gyro compass and they had no replacements. The priest was relaunched over an hour later. They would use the Radnetsky sonar system to guide them in. Misak had a tough time getting the priest to the Kursk, but he finally landed the mini-sub directly on the aft hatch. He said, I am directly over the hatch, but I cannot make a seal. Battery showing low again. Can you observe any signs of life? Nope, I cannot. The PK-7500 arrived in the area carrying the more navigable Beaster, but they couldn't launch the AS-36 in this terrible weather. Time for Plan B. They would return to the coast, launch the submersible at Pachnitsha Harbor and tow it back to the rescue site with a salvage tug. A state TV journalist broadcasting live from the Peter the Great told the world that the Russian submersibles couldn't attach to the Kursk. The United States took the broadcast to mean that Russia was about to flinch. At the embassy in Moscow, U.S. naval attaché Captain Bob Brennan had received the signed offer to help of U.S. Defense Secretary William Cohen. Dear Marshal Sergeyev, I must extend my deepest thoughts of concern to you and your valued crew members aboard the Kursk. I know I speak for the entire U.S. Department of Defense in expressing our sincerest hopes for the best possible outcome. In the meantime, our thoughts are with you and the crew's families. We wish them strength during this most troubling time. My department stands ready to provide any assistance you may need. Please do not hesitate to ask. Sincerely, Bill Cohen. 
Brennan arrived with the offer at the Ministry of Defense that evening, but the young duty officer wouldn't let him pass. Brennan began a conspicuous vigil in the foyer, constantly asking the young men to think of the lives of his fellow countrymen who were trapped on the water. Eventually, the duty officer was brought to tears and escorted Brennan inside. The attaché handed the offer to Sir Jive's staff, but he doubted it would be accepted. Then Washington undermined him behind his back. The Pentagon had decided to play hardball. The Russians had to retract their baseless collision allegations or U.S. rescue assets wouldn't be deployed. Brennan was like, are you kidding me right now? This is not the time to do this. No one said it was an American submarine. Well, it was implied. The defense secretary was pretty hot about the allegations. Brennan was overruled and begrudgingly informed to jive of the new conditions. The marshal wouldn't accept the U.S. offer, but he would send Vice Admiral Alexander Pabogie to NATO headquarters in Belgium to continue the discussion. In two days. With NATO. The Navy needed to answer the overwhelming request for information from the press and the public and debunk all the wild theories about what had happened to the Kursk. So the Northern Fleet scheduled a press conference Tuesday evening with Admiral Matsak. Matsak suddenly pulled out, claiming he was too busy with the rescue operations. Instead, Igor Baranov of Rubin Central Design Bureau for Marine Engineering, the company that had designed the Kursk, showed up. Baranov knew the Kursk, his own boat. He proudly explained about the emergency and survival systems aboard the Kursk. The boat is the best in the world in terms of life support for sailors. We can't know the reason for the accident or the scale of it, but in the Kursk there are food, water and oxygen regeneration systems. The entire crew can be saved. Baranov directly contradicted Admiral Kuriedo's bleak comments 24 hours earlier and speculated that the crew might survive five or possibly six days. Russia had reasons to hope again. Soon after, however, a leak to Reuters news service declared that the oxygen aboard the Kursk was running low. The Navy established the hotline, but who was supposed to call the hotline? The Russian government had not published an official list and no one had contacted the families. There were entire families who didn't even know whether their loved ones were on board the Kursk. Shortly after midnight, the priest was unable to create a vacuum to open the ninth compartment escape hatch, twice. As the priest was being lifted back onto the mothership, her propulsion system, periscope and propellers were severely damaged. The rescue crew had no spare parts, so they cannibalized the AS-32 to fix the AS-34. While they were working, trying to get the priest back into the water, all rescue operations ground to a halt. When the admirals on the Peter the Great saw that nothing was happening, they bombarded the Ratnetsky with messages demanding to know why the rescue submersibles were not in the water. Our people are dying! The rescue crew was furious about the constant harassment. People were taking insane risks here. On Wednesday morning, the 16th of August, four days after the accident, the Beaster was being towed back to the accident site. Meanwhile, more experienced pilots arrived from St. Petersburg. Among them was Sholokhov, the former commander of the priest. He was the best in the business. If he couldn't make the submersible to the Kursk, no one could. Deputy Prime Minister Klebanov, in charge of the Commission of Inquiry to determine what sank the Kursk, presented three theories to the world. She had collided with a runaway foreign submarine, there had been a problem with a torpedo, or, and this was new, the unsinkable Kursk may have hit a World War II mine. Klebanov also said that there were no signs of life from the sub, and almost all of the sailors had died before the vessel hit the bottom. Holy contradictory information, Batman! 
Adding to the relentless flow of contradictions, Navy spokesman De Gala told the world that the crew members aboard the Kursk knew that help was underway. Russian help, of course, because outside help was rejected. They had no time to coordinate their efforts. And the reason the Russian submersibles couldn't dock with the Kursk was because of the bad weather. And because the Kursk was listing to port 60 degrees. And because visibility was unacceptable at just a few inches. And because strong underwater currents made it impossible to connect a rescue submersible. No country's technology in the world could handle that. Commodore Russell changed his strategy based on these facts. But, as a Barron Sea veteran, he doubted the current and visibility claim. But if the Kursk was leaning 60 degrees, it was gonna be tough to attach the LR-5 to the hatch. On Wednesday afternoon, the rescue vehicle LR-5, the remote-operated vehicle Scorpio, together with 20 crew and support staff, took off for Trondheim, Norway, aboard the Antonov aircraft. No one had asked for them, but off they went. Meanwhile, the media watched President Putin's every move in Sochi and reported it all. The dude was appointing Russian ambassadors to Jamaica and Chile, he had called a beloved Russian actress to wish her a happy birthday. Jeez Louise, read the room. The press was merciless. Popular daily Komsomolskaya Pravda published a chronicle of tragedies and lies, pointing out that Western observers had forced Russian officials to acknowledge that the accident had occurred 24 hours earlier than they had initially claimed. The influential Moscow newspaper, Nizavizimeya Gazeta, went on the attack against Putin, comparing the Kursk crisis to the 1986 Chernobyl nuclear plant disaster. The beginning of the Putin era could turn out to be comparable to the early years of Mikhail Gorbachev's rule, generously soaked in the blood of Russians. The reformacy Votnia quoted an unnamed Navy source, Admirals believe that if even one Russian sailor is saved from the Russian submarine with foreign aid, this will definitely end in a political disaster. At 2 p.m., Putin took a few questions from a small group of Kremlin pool reporters after entertaining some scholars from the Russia's Academy of Science. One journalist suddenly sideswiped the president and asked about the Kursk. Putin calmly stated that the situation was beyond critical, but everything was being done to save the crew. He said, All the necessary and possible actions to save the crew and boat were taken from the very start, immediately after it was known that something had happened. When I asked if anything else could be done to save the crew, our experts said that they have all the equipment they need. Unfortunately, it's devilishly bad luck. The weather is very bad, a storm has raged for two days, and sailors could not use all the means at their disposal. Moscow raised the number of crew members on the Kursk at the time of the sinking, from 116 to 118. But still, no one knew who exactly was on board. In the US, President Clinton placed an early morning phone call that President Putin had requested the week before. After discussing some non-urgent but important issues for 20 minutes, Clinton carefully brought up the Kursk incident, still unsure how much the military leaders had told Putin. The US president implored the Russian president to ask for help, if not from them, then from another country nearby. Putin said that they were exploring their options, but his men said that they had everything they needed. But then, an hour later, Putin apparently changed his mind and ordered Admiral Kuryedov to accept help, wherever it comes from. Some Northern Fleet officers felt that the president inviting the foreign rescuers was a humiliating defeat, but it was actually a brilliant political move. The president had bought the Russian rescuers time. It would be a while before the foreigners arrived. 
If the Russian rescuers got into the sub before they did, national pride would go through the roof. If they failed, then no one could say they hadn't asked for help. And because the president had ordered the navy to accept help, the admiral saved face. Still, Admiral Papo felt humiliated and betrayed. When in the history ever had a Russian admiral been forced to beg a Cold War enemy for assistance? But he called Skorgen on their direct line. The Norwegian admiral told him, What do you need? I got you, boo. I need divers, men who can operate down to a depth of 110 meters. I need them to help us connect our rescue submersibles to the rescue hatch. That way we can reach the survivors in the submarine. Can you help? So there were survivors then. Divers who can operate at such depths were deep sea saturation divers. Saturation diving required decompression chambers. Norway's navy didn't have them. They could be found in the private industry, like companies in the offshore oil and gas business. So the Norwegian government frantically started calling all the country's major offshore companies. Specialist divers and equipment, anyone? Money's no issue, they'd handle that. The multinational Stolt Offshore agreed to assist in any way possible and offered their diving support vessel the Seaway Eagle. They had no divers available, but they knew who to call. Skorgen called Popov and told him that he needed technical information, and lots of it. They couldn't go into this operation blind. They needed to know about their submarine rescue systems, the hatches and the valves. In other words, Admiral, please pass all the technical data on a highly classified Russian nuclear-powered cruise missile submarine to a Western commander. Popov took a moment, then agreed to send the info. British naval attaché in Moscow, Jeff McCready, was stunned that no one wanted to accept Britain's help. He asked some retirees from the St. Petersburg Club of Submariners what was going on. Some of the old submariners went on live television to ask that very question. And a presto, McCready got an invite from two admirals in the Defense Ministry, Vladislav Ilyin and Alek Baboji, who ran a special Kursk incident unit in Moscow. When Oscar II class submarine design and engineering experts showed up, McCready knew they were serious. He asked if the Russian Navy had been telling the truth about the situation on the scene. Were there really dangerous three knot currents around the Kursk? No, just one knot. Was the visibility really that bad? Only a few inches? No, it's over 32 feet. Was the Kursk really listing heavily 30 to 60 degrees? No, just 8 degrees. They told McCready that the bow section along with the first compartment escape hatch was destroyed. There was no way in forward or through the sail. The only way into the Kursk was through an escape hatch at the stern. The British LR5 personnel had never seen a Russian escape hatch in their lives and they were going to need diagrams and technical info. The Oscar II expert handed McCready a rough diagram showing vertical and horizontal plans of the hatch and explained the valve lineup to open it. They would need more info, but McCready figured they'd get more data underway. By the end of Wednesday, August 15th, four and a half days after the Kursk went down, the Russians formally asked for the LR5 and the British government authorized the deployment of their rescue team. Russell's call to action on Monday had been justified. Everything was already on its way. The Russians never asked how the Royal Navy managed to reach the scene so quickly, ahead even of the Seaway Eagle that Norway was sending. But the foreign rescuers were finally coming to try to save the Kursk crew.